These are new terrorists training in Northern Ireland, another generation of extremists. Violent Republicans have not gone away. And an old friend on the run, Colonel Gaddafi, still wants to help them in their fight. Having supported the IRA for decades, his weapons turned them into a major fighting force. They were used to kill, maim and destroy for over 30 years. Some of them are still active. Rather than enduring peace on the streets of Northern Ireland, riots and violence still erupt. This program has been told that even in hiding, Gaddafi's final act of defiance is to send cash to these new terror groups. This is the story of how the Libyan dictator helped change the balance of power in Northern Ireland, and how his legacy continues to be used against the United Kingdom. Libya today, a country trying to find freedom and democracy after 40 years under a brutal dictator. Colonel Gaddafi, toppled from power and in hiding, but still a potent threat. Dead or alive, his aggressive policy of funding terrorism around the world lingers on, especially in Britain, where Gaddafi sent assassins to murder Libyans who opposed him, and where he armed the IRA. Homegrown terrorists fighting a long and bitter battle against British rule in Northern Ireland. I started looking at links between Gaddafi and his regime and the IRA uh, almost 20 years ago. It came out of a case I was doing against the chief of staff of the IRA, and allegations arose in that of the IRA getting weaponry and support from Libya. Jason McHugh is representing the families of victims. Victims of IRA bombs made from components given to the IRA by Colonel Gaddafi. This personal footage was filmed in April this year, when Jason went to Benghazi to talk to rebel leaders to secure compensation for British families bereaved by Libyan-sponsored terrorism. Over the course of 30 years, the Libyan dictator supported the IRA. He donated money, arms and Semtex explosives to help fuel a war in Ireland and Britain, resulting in more deaths than the entire 9-11 attack. And you start thinking of all those bombs, from Enniskillen to Manchester to Warrington, all the way through to the Baltic Exchange and Canary Wharf. All of those were Libyan Semtex. All of these attacks used weapons or explosives supplied by Libya. But how they came to be in IRA hands is a story which goes right back to the birth of the Troubles. In the late 60s, many Catholics in Northern Ireland believed they were treated as second-class citizens, denied homes, jobs, and the right to vote. First, you had to have your own home to get a vote. So Catholics were by far the, the lesser people who could buy a house and therefore denied them the chance of getting a vote. Protestants, who outnumbered Catholics two to one, ruled in the British province. They saw the marches as a threat. The Royal Ulster Constabulary and the B-Specials, an almost exclusively Protestant police force, responded with brutality. In the summer of 1969, anti-Catholic rage erupted, unleashing extreme sectarian violence. Thousands fled. Bombay Street was burnt to the ground. On the 15th of August 1969, the British government sent in the army to keep the peace. The presence of the army on the streets was like a red rag to a bull to the traditional Republicans who wanted the British out of Northern Ireland. A new breed of IRA terrorists emerged to try and end British rule in the province. It spawned a campaign of terror that would last for decades. The IRA, when it decided to go to war, had targets on the street now. They could attack the British Army. And of course, the, the police, the OUC, were also targets. On September the 1st, 1969, just weeks after the violence in West Belfast, another uprising was taking place. 1,500 miles away in the Libyan capital of Tripoli, a young army officer by the name of Muammar Gaddafi 
led a coup deposing King Idris, bringing centuries of colonial rule to an end. Gaddafi set up the new Libyan Arab Republic and immediately shut down all British military bases and expelled British forces from the country. His foreign policy was very aggressive, anti-imperialist, anti-Israel, anti-American to a great extent, um, in favor of supporting freedom movements around the world and so on. Um, and uh, he carried that to, it, to, to great extremes. So Libya became a haven for all sorts of nasties from all over the place, including fanatics and, and murderers. Sorry, you have annoyed me in England, therefore you... Irish extremists began to exploit Gaddafi's anti-British policies. Gaddafi was a very young uh, revolutionary zealous who felt that he had a duty to fight imperialism all over the world. And because of that, he thought of the United Kingdom as an enemy and he had to fight the United Kingdom. And because of that, I believe or I suppose that he thought um, supporting uh, uh, and backing the IRA was one way of fighting the United Kingdom. And the newly formed provisional IRA cashed in, getting weapons and money. I joined Provisional IRA, kind of with my eyes wide open, really. I'm joining something that's kind of popular front, which is a much better chance of getting the British out of Ireland than the official IRA did. The Provisionals began organising for war, with young committed members being placed in senior positions. Sean O'Callaghan became an IRA training officer in Kerry, in Southern Ireland. I was training people from all over Ireland, but particularly from Belfast. And I was a 16-year-old who knew a lot about guns and explosives and, and what you did with them. Other rising stars included Martin McGuinness in Derry and, according to written histories of the IRA, Jerry Adams in Belfast. Within two years, the provisional IRA launched a bombing campaign against the British Army and the Northern Ireland state. But at the same time, they were pressing for talks, and Martin McGuinness and Jerry Adams, who was interned, were flown over as part of an IRA team for a secret meeting in London. The very fact that they were taken seriously, brought on a RAF military plane, brought to a lovely house in Cheney Walk, meet William Whitelaw, they thought they were in the driving seat. The three-hour meeting came to nothing, but the relationship between Adams, McGuinness, and British officials is said to have continued on and off ever since. The IRA stepped up their bombing campaign. You'd hear bombs going off on a fairly regular basis. And then we had Bloody Friday, when about 22 bombing incidents uh, took place in Belfast. As the conflict intensified, the need for more explosives grew. I finished up in a bomb factory in County Leitrim. We made two tonne of explosives every week, which was then distributed across Northern Ireland. Until now, the Provisionals had only a few old Second World War guns. Weapons were so scarce, anyone who lost a gun could expect to be shot. As Colonel Gaddafi took up their cause and became their sponsor, this was about to change. In a radio broadcast, he announced, We support the revolutionaries of Ireland who oppose Britain and are motivated by nationalism and religion. Senior provisionals visited Libya to arrange deliveries by sea and air of arms and cash. Over the next three years, Gaddafi was to channel three and a half million pounds into the IRA's coffers, as well as guns and military hardware. One of the early consignments would be sent by plane. Sean O'Callaghan was part of the group sent to break into a small airfield and set up the secret landing. We all rendezvoused, got into the back of a cattle truck, and we went to the airport. Cut the gates, there's nobody there. But the runway had to be lit up all along the way. So you had generators and essentially what were old car lights, bulbs in them, right along the runway, lighting it up for the person to land in. 
but the plane never arrived. They returned the following night and it still didn't show. On the third night it finally appeared, but was unable to touch down. It was too large for such a short runway. With inside help, they arranged for the plane to land at Shannon International Airport, where it was unloaded in secret. What I later discovered was that the plane diverted and got it landed at Shannon and 200 RPG-7 rocket launchers that had come from Libya were landed in Ireland. Gaddafi began to send larger consignments by boat. The IRA could now take on more ambitious targets. O'Callaghan joined an audacious attack on a British army base, armed with guns, mortars and RPG-7s. The portable rocket propelled grenade launches sent from Gaddafi. There was about 14 full-time fire air guys. My job is to start launching the mortars, which had come from Libya. Gun battle lasts for about 20 minutes. Nobody's any real idea of what's going on. It's complete chaos. This attack claimed the life of a woman soldier from the Ulster Defence Regiment. Worried about growing violence in Northern Ireland and the increased firepower of the IRA, Harold Wilson's government made a secret offer to Gaddafi. Highly confidential documents recently declassified revealed that Britain offered 14 million pounds to Gaddafi as part of a trade package on condition he renounced the IRA. Gaddafi had wanted 52 million, so rejected the offer. The bombs which are convulsing Britain and breaking its spirit are the bombs of Libyan people. We have sent them to the Irish revolutionaries so that the British will pay the price for their past deeds. It wouldn't be long before Gaddafi was sending more cargoes of arms, but they would be on a far bigger scale. They would change the balance of power in Ireland. On May the 4th, 1979, Margaret Thatcher becomes Prime Minister and takes a hard line on terrorists. The IRA stepped up its violent campaign to provoke her. On August the 27th, Earl Mountbatten, the Queen's cousin and Prince Charles' favourite uncle, is blown up aboard his boat while holidaying in Ireland. On the same day, 18 British soldiers are ambushed and killed at Warren Point, County Down. But violence wasn't the only weapon. In 1981, a group of IRA prisoners led by Bobby Sands inside Belfast's Mays Prison go on hunger strike. They wanted to be treated as political prisoners, not criminals. A stand that generated worldwide attention and boosted IRA numbers at home. People like myself were young teenagers at the time, and we could not understand why something so easy to concede was not given, and 10 people were allowed to die, which uh, created a massive uh, influx of young people and who both the IRA and the Annale. On the 5th of May, 1981, Bobby Sands died. Nine other fellow prisoners would follow. Gaddafi appealed to the United Nations to intervene against what he saw as Britain's inhumane conduct. The IRA hit back and planned a high-profile bombing in London. In April 1983, O'Callaghan was sent on a mission to assassinate Prince Charles and the Princess of Wales. The plan to kill Charles and Diana was born out of revenge for the hunger strikes. The plan was to plant a bomb at the Dominion Theatre at London's Tottenham Court Road. A royal gala was being held there for the Prince's Trust, featuring Diana's favourite bands, Duran Duran and Dire Straits. I went to the Dominion Theatre, walked to the lavatory beside the royal box, looked at the tiles and thought, yep, yeah, I can take out a couple of tiles, put the bomb in here, wrap it in just as the Brighton bomb, put the tiles back on again. And, yeah, it would have killed them, yeah. But O'Callaghan never planted the bomb. Unbeknown to the IRA, 
He was now working undercover for the Irish police. He alerted the security forces and slipped across the channel to France. The following year, another high-profile attack did go ahead. The IRA's Brighton bomb narrowly missed Margaret Thatcher. It killed five people and injured 34. Yes, we were, we were, we were very lucky. You hear about these atrocities, these bombs. You don't expect them to happen to you. The Brighton bomb was the kind of high-profile attack on Britain that Gaddafi had been hoping for, an act of terrorism on British soil. By proxy, Gaddafi was able to carry out killings abroad. But when it came to silencing homegrown opponents, he took a more direct approach. Gaddafi was killing critics and opponents inside Libya, publicly hanging them. Gaddafi directly sent people, his own people, to kill Libyan opponents in the streets of London. He killed one just outside the mosque and one in his office. When Gaddafi publicly hanged two students in Tripoli, protesters gathered to demonstrate outside the Libyan embassy in London. Juma El Gamati was one of the organizers. He started to chant slogans against Gaddafi, like down, down with Gaddafi, no to dictatorship in Libya, you know, yes to freedom in Libya, and no to hanging students in Libya, and so on. And within a few minutes, we noticed that two windows on the first floor of the embassy, and then we heard this uh, huge rattling noise. <laughs> within a few seconds, we realized that it was actually firing live bullets at us. A machine gun from the Libyan embassy sprayed bullets towards the demonstrators, hitting 10 of them and fatally injuring policewoman Yvonne Fletcher. She died an hour later. I was standing at the front of the students because I was one of the organizers. I remember very clearly that um, the young WBC Yvonne Fletcher was standing about three yards away from me uh, with her back to the embassy building. And suddenly I noticed, I looked and I noticed that she just fell and then I noticed that a lot of blood was pouring out of her. To us, that's a vindication of what we felt and what we've been saying about Gaddafi, that this man is ruthless and will go to any extent to silence his critics. British police put the embassy under an 11-day siege. In retaliation, Gaddafi ordered the British embassy in Tripoli to be surrounded. We, the British and the Libyan side, are continuing to work for a peaceful solution of the problem. I don't want to go beyond that. It was um, two weeks of extreme drama, really. We found we were, the embassy was surrounded by Libyan police, and we protested and said this was contrary to the Vienna Convention on Diplomatic Relations and so on, and they said, we don't know anything about that. So. In London, a deal to allow the Libyan embassy staff to go free was skillfully negotiated by Nasser Ashur, number three in Libyan intelligence. No one was arrested for the murder of WPC Yvonne Fletcher. In response, Oliver Miles was given a week to leave Libya, and the British embassy there was closed. It wasn't a wise reaction, in my opinion. It was a necessary reaction. We had to do it. Public opinion was so outraged, there was no, no choice. Um, but it didn't actually further our interests, on the contrary because it was after we broke off relations that uh, Gaddafi did more harm to us than before. Libya now stepped up its dealings with the IRA. Travelling on a false passport, Ashur made several trips to Dublin to meet the IRA's top men. He offered them $10 million and 300 tonnes of modern sophisticated weaponry to be used against Margaret Thatcher's government. To the IRA, it was like winning the lottery. The first consignment was picked up in August 1985 by a fishing boat, the Casamara. The boat set sail to Malta. The Maltese connection would prove to be pivotal in all the armed shipments to Ireland. Gaddafi had considerable influence on the island, which he still uses as a financial base. He has frozen assets there worth over 80 million pounds. Off the coast, Nasser Ashur oversaw the loading of the consignment from a Libyan ship. Very soon, seven tons of weapons would be landed at Clogger Strand, a radar blind spot on a remote stretch of the Wicklow coast. The shipment contained around 300 boxes with 70 AK-47s, 
automatic pistols, two or three heavy machine guns, and several boxes of cartridges and grenades. Well, I recall going into a house one time and uh, I opened a cupboard of a, a kitchen cupboard to get a, a drink of water. I left the glass out and there was like uh, 20 hand grenades fell out of the cupboard, you know, and just landed all around me, you know. I mean, the weaponry was uh, unbelievable. The amount of it was unbelievable. Another shipment just months later brought in a further 10 tons of Gaddafi's weapons, including pistols, 10 heavy machine guns, 70 boxes of ammunition, grenades, mortars, rocket-propelled grenades, Semtex, and a further 100 AK-47s. The AK-47 is a very effective weapon. It fires in bursts. The AK-47 was a step change in their development, which made them more dangerous. These Libyan-supplied assault rifles were ideal terrorist weapons. Martin Meehan was caught using one of them. I felt that the only way that the British government would listen, the people like myself who threw the barrel of a gun. Uh, when I was 21, I was arrested after a gun attack on the RUC in North Belfast. Uh, I was captured with an AKM rifle after firing approximately 27 shots at the RUC patrol. And uh, I was received 12 years in prison. The battle between Gaddafi and the West was about to escalate. In April 1986, US planes carried out an airstrike on Gaddafi's home. The attack was in retaliation for a Libyan bombing of a discotheque in Berlin, used by American servicemen. The airstrike killed 80 people. Gaddafi claimed his adopted baby daughter, Hannah, died in the attack. The aircraft had taken off from Britain with the approval of Margaret Thatcher. I think it was the result of that that Gaddafi gave, the, gave Semtex to the IRA. It was in revenge for our having attempted to kill him and succeeded in killing a substantial number of Libyans, including members of his family. Gaddafi's consignments to Ireland grew larger and more deadly. In July 1986, a further 14 tons of weapons and explosives arrived at Clocker Strand, including Semtex, and SAM-7 anti-aircraft surface-to-air missiles. In October, a bigger boat brought back a massive 105 tons of weaponry, including 1,000 AK-47s, SAM-7s, and an assortment of guns. And once more, the most prized item in the shipment was Semtex, the highly destructive and undetectable plastic explosive. It would prove to be the most lethal of all the IRA's weapons. The Libyan Semtex in particular was probably the biggest single game changer in terms of the Libyan arms consignment because of the increase in capability. With the Libyan Semtex, the Para began to deploy, for example, very sophisticated undercar booby trap devices. Many people lost their lives with those. They were able to develop new anti armor weapons like the propelled um, improvised grenade, the PRIG. And um, these could be fired from a distance. Uh, if they hit the side of an armoured vehicle and detonated, they would penetrate virtually any armour up to almost a main battle tank. So there was no armour protection available in practice against them. I think they boosted the IRA morale enormously because um, they had uh, the ability to say two things. One was that we've got better weapons. And secondly, that we have international support. And I think this was a, a great bonus to them. The IRA expected one more, even larger, shipment from Gaddafi. But even they didn't know just how big the shipment was going to be. It took Libyan soldiers working with a crane two nights in October 1987 to load 130 tons of weapons and explosives onto the Exunt, an aging freighter moored in Tripoli Harbor. Gaddafi's dream of enabling the IRA to bombard Britain was now on its way to becoming a reality. In October 1987, Gaddafi's largest shipment of arms to the IRA set sail from Tripoli. The size of the cargo was so big, the captain worried he could never unload it by hand. But no one knew how to say no to Gaddafi. This latest shipment was doomed from the start. 
On leaving Libya, the accent was shadowed by MI6 and the French Secret Service. On entering the Bay of Biscay, armed French officers boarded the vessel and towed it into the harbor at Brest. They unloaded two tons of Semtex, 2,000 electric detonators, 1,000 AK-47 assault rifles, 120 RPG-7 armor-piercing rocket-propelled grenades, 20 SAM-7 surface-to-air missiles, 10 DHK heavy machine guns, 600 grenades, 1,000 mortars, 4,700 fuses, 1 million rounds of ammunition. When the authorities interrogated the captain, they learned that four other shipments from Gaddafi had already got through. Now they realized the scale of the Libyan arsenal given to the IRA. It sent a shockwave through British security forces, who understood that the IRA was now equipped for a very long war. You know, terrorists need three things, really, to survive at any time. They need weapons, they need money, and they need political support. And with this boost in weapons, they had enough weapons to carry on this campaign virtually indefinitely. Gaddafi made no secret of his support for the IRA. We uh, believe uh, the cause of, uh, of uh, Ireland is a just cause. And we support this just cause. Because we believe Ireland is Ireland and Britain is uh, Britain. And the existence of Britain in the north of Ireland is uh, the sense of colonization. Gaddafi's interference helped create radical new thinking in Whitehall that would have long-term consequences. British government officials could see no end to the conflict and the rising cost of peacekeeping. A former Downing Street insider has told this program that a plan was hatched behind Margaret Thatcher's back to hand Northern Ireland over to Dublin. It undermined her Iron Lady stance on terrorism, and she didn't like it. But an alliance of politicians and government officials pushed the plan ahead. Although Northern Ireland remained British, this strategy laid the foundations of what later became the peace process. But there were a lot more bombs and bullets to come. With the IRA now equipped like a professional army, their attacks became more sophisticated. The introduction of these weapons probably set us back five to ten years, and we lost many good officers, many soldiers, um, because of this. Gaddafi's weapons had upped the ante. We were forced off the roads, which then slowed down our progress, which is why we eventually had to travel by helicopter. As always with counter-terrorism, there are technical changes which take place and you have to go through that sort of technical business, each side trying to outdo the other, technically. With Gaddafi's heavy machine guns, it was possible to shoot down a helicopter, as the terrorists' own footage of 1988 shows. This was what the security forces feared most. It may have been a lucky hit, but for the army and crew, once was enough. No one died in this attack, but there were many other deadly arms to fear. They introduced a whole new class of weapons in terms of side-firing mortars, which could take out an armoured vehicle, and also um, handheld grenade launchers, which could penetrate an armoured vehicle and kill, kill the crew. But by far the most deadly part of Gaddafi's shipments was Semtex. Virtually every IRA bomb since 1986 has incorporated Libyan-supplied Semtex. If there was one gift, and it was a gift from Gaddafi, it was the Semtex. All those big bombs that we all remember turning on the news and listening to Manchester bombing, Warrington bombing, Enniskillen, had used Libyan Semtex. IRA attacks became more audacious. On February the 7th, 1991, a mortar fired from a transit van landed in the garden of 10 Downing Street. John Major was told had it landed 10 feet closer, half the cabinet could have been killed. The strategy of attack and negotiation did bring a ceasefire. By 1995, the people of Northern Ireland were beginning to believe that at last a peace was possible. But then on February the 9th, 1996, 17 months of peace ended. 
the bomber Canary Wharf killed two people and caused 85 million pounds of damage. Although this was a half-ton fertilizer bomb, it got its high explosive kick from the five kilograms of Libyan Semtex packed within it. One bomb in London done more damage than all the bombs in the six counties over a 20-year period. I mean, that, that's colossal. And the threat of that taking place in the city of London, again, brought the British government to the negotiating table. No doubt about that. When Tony Blair took over as Prime Minister in 1997, he made it his mission to take the peace process forward. Within two months, the IRA called a ceasefire. Even without bombs going off, there were still stories of intimidation. At one point, during peace talks at Downing Street, there was a serious security alert. 18 mobile phones, known by the security services to have been bought by the IRA, were suddenly switched on within a one-mile radius of Whitehall. Security services track and monitor suspect mobile phones in the hands of militants, in case they're used to trigger bombs. It was an unnerving reminder of the potential threat terrorists can wield. In the Good Friday Agreement, the British government would scale down troop numbers and installations, release paramilitary prisoners, and bring in human rights and policing reforms. In return, the IRA were expected to declare an end to conflict. I have huge respect for what they did because they took an organization that was totally wedded, physical force tradition of republicanism, and they moved it on into a attempt to reach a peaceful accommodation with its neighbors. And I think the vast majority of people moved on in that way. I think actually the vast majority of the entire community in Northern Ireland moved on in that way. Gaddafi's weapons had been used for peace as well as war. They were still a serious threat, but had brought both sides together in the Good Friday Agreement. But some Republicans feel this falls far short of the goals they had fought and died for. The leadership voted to accept the Good Friday Agreement and in doing so, accepting that the Unionist population in the six counties have a right to veto Irish reunification. That was a massive step backwards for Irish Republicans and Irish nationalism. The war on terror launched by the US after 9-11 changed everything. Gaddafi offered to help fight al-Qaeda and stop sending arms to the IRA. The IRA's decision to formally end its armed campaign and today's announcements are January Finally, on the 28th of July 2005, the IRA declared its campaign of violence was over. Two months later, international weapons inspectors announced that the IRA arsenal had been put beyond use. John de Chastelain, a retired Canadian general, oversaw the weapons decommissioning. They have told us that they believe they have given us everything they have, and we believe them. But some in Northern Ireland did not share his certainty. I don't even think the British government have any clear view, or clear understanding of what percentage of the weapons were destroyed. Um, some people estimated it as low as 50%, others put it much higher. I'm not surprised that some Libyan weapons are still there. I'm not surprised that some of them are now turning up in the hands of dissidents, um, particularly AK-47 rifles and perhaps some Semtex. After seven months of airstrikes, Colonel Gaddafi was deposed. But even in hiding, he's still threatening. With tensions in Northern Ireland increasing, Gaddafi again wants to exploit unrest. This program has been told that in a final act of defiance, Gaddafi has once more tried to support Republican terrorists in Ireland. In June of this year, a Libyan courier flew into a London airport from Zurich, carrying a heavy suitcase. Security sources have told this program that inside was a large package wrapped in plastic, a gift from Gaddafi. The sources said that the gift was $2 million in cash and was on its way to Southern Ireland. The bundles of dollars were packed in Malta, 
the Mediterranean island where some of Gaddafi's backdoor deals had been put together. In London, the courier went to ground in one of the many expensive properties owned by the Gaddafi family. It's believed the man hid in an apartment in Hans Crescent, behind Harrods in Knightsbridge. MI6 has been told that the cash was on its way to a businessman supporter of one of the new militant dissident Republican groups who have claimed responsibility for attacks against police in Northern Ireland. It's not known whether the money reached its destination and we've been unable to check these claims independently. MI6 said they would not deny or confirm this information. Security forces fear that the dissidents are growing and gaining support and new cash from Gaddafi would help them restock with more weapons. You can certainly get them from Eastern Europe, and that can be put right. It's just a question of having the money to pay for them, and you can, you can obtain on the market what you want. In 2009, the real IRA claimed they carried out an assault on the Massarine army barracks in County Antrim, killing two British soldiers. Two days later, the Continuity IRA claimed responsibility for the shooting of Police Constable Stephen Carroll. And in February of this year, Catholic policeman Ronan Kerr was blown up by a car bomb believed to have been made with Libyan Semtex. Many observers believe the dissidents are preparing for another long war. We were sent this footage by one group. An anonymous message said it was a training film made earlier this year. Terrorist weapons analyst David Clayton was an army intelligence officer in Iraq and served three tours in Northern Ireland. When you analyse it, it looks to be a small group of, of young men playing for the camera, really. It looks to be a four or five man team practising basic patrolling skills. They're dressed in British Army combat gear, balaclavas. All of their clothing appears to be virtually brand new, the boots are brand new, and they're using AKMs and AK-47s, high-velocity assault rifles, the AKM variants which are rife through in the Middle East or North Africa. On the centre of the screen there, moving to the right, you see a guy with a, uh, a different weapon to all the others. The others have got 7.62mm um, assault rifles. He's got a, it looks to be an improvised 9mm, and so the magazine sits on the side, uh, and it uses the same ammunition that a pistol would use. It's very small, it's discreet, you can take the magazine off and that will fit into a, a large pocket or inside a jacket. They've picked three or four different weapons, so it shows they've got a, a wide capacity. That's what I think what they're trying to achieve, rather than just all turn up with all the same rifles. I would say he's probably had some military training because he's stripping the rifle down in, in a military style. He does the normal safety precautions, he unloads it, he checks inside, he then strips it down in a logical sequence. He's going through some perfunctory checks to make sure that the barrel's clear and there's no obstructions and damage, make sure it works, load it, make it ready, and then carry on. A 10 minute lesson, and you're relatively proficient in how it works. Pretty much anybody can use it. Dr. John Horgan has spent the last two years studying violent dissident Republican groups in Ireland. He believes they are recruiting young people, as well as using the knowledge and skills of older IRA fighters. So they look for electricians, they look for people with military experience. They look for people with some experience in, 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 in weaponry, for example. They certainly have gone uh, a long way, the, the, the violent dissident groups have gone a long way in reaching out to those with connections in the organized crime world, so to try to procure sophisticated weaponry. His research reveals that many dissidents used to belong to the IRA. We've seen disaffected Irish Republicans who were once involved in the provisional IRA in their, in their 50s and early 60s. We also see people that, were, that are now in their early 30s, and we also see teenagers and even some children that are being effectively groomed into the dissident movements. And this, to me, suggests that there certainly is a strategic element in planning for the future here. Last year, MI5 raised the threat level posed by Republican terror groups from moderate to substantial. When a 200-pound bomb exploded in Derry last year, the Home Secretary warned that Britain still faced Irish terrorism. 
I also want to talk today about the fight against extremism and terrorism. A threat we face not just from Al-Qaeda, but, as we've seen today, also from Irish-related terrorism. Some dissident political pressure groups are openly opposing elected Republicans who now help govern Ulster. They're critical of former colleagues they once believed in. Martin Meehan, who says he's no longer involved in violence, speaks on behalf of the Republican Network for Unity. I'm Martin McInnes, the deputy first minister of the north of Ireland, who administers British rule in Ireland. That's what he does. I think he's a disgrace. I think he's a hypocrite. I think he hasn't got the right to speak on behalf of Republicans in general. He's part of a new Sinn Féin, a new Republican movement, who administers British rule in Ireland. And he's wrong. As is Jerry Adams, they're wrong. They have duped people into believing that their strategy is the correct strategy. That is not the correct strategy. The correct strategy is hold on to those principles that Republicans have held on to from 200 years ago, and that is to break the connection. That's the correct strategy. Everything else is compromise. Hardliner Brendan McKenna, a former IRA activist, jailed for six years for a bomb attack, became an advisor to Sinn Féin in government. He was described by Tony Blair as one of the most unreasonable people he ever tried to negotiate with. He now leads a new radical political party. His views are very influential among disillusioned Republicans, especially young people struggling to find a job. I and others like me who had given a substantial part of their lives uh, to, to the Republican struggle still believe that, you know, the real path towards uh, peace and permanent peace in Ireland can only be achieved through the reunification of our country. This is the modern face of Belfast. But behind the metal and glass creations of the Titanic Quarter lies another city. <laughs> Belfast in July of this year. The simmering tensions that divide communities are still explosive. This riot was sparked by a Protestant march in a Catholic neighborhood. Such situations are the breeding ground for potential new militants. Today there are more walls and barricades than there were during the Troubles. 37 so-called peace lines now divide the city. Bombay Street, once burned to the ground, has been rebuilt. Now a 60-foot high fence divides it from a Protestant area, and the backs of the houses are encased in thick wire mesh to protect them from stones and petrol bombs. Distant Irish republicanism, that hasn't gone away. I'm absolutely convinced that hasn't gone away. There's still that strand of thought, which is in the, certainly in the South, and that, will, in my view, will reassert itself over the next 50 years or so, and will eventually break out in, in some form of violence. It's this history of repeated violent struggle against Britain that Gaddafi is counting on. The Prime Minister has just warned that Gaddafi's legacy has not gone away. There's no doubt that the Libyan provision of Semtex uh, to the IRA was immensely damaging uh, and uh, over many years and possibly even still today. With his long rule over and his fate uncertain, even those he once helped may soon desert Gaddafi. Luckily, the Libyan people have won. So now, if those who have been associated with the IRA really believe in democracy, in freedom, in people should fulfill their aspirations, and that people have a right to revolution, peaceful revolution, then I hope that those IRA members or ex-members or ex-leaders will come out and say, we should not have dealt with a nasty man like Colonel Gaddafi. Just ignored and Jason McHugh has reached an agreement in principle to facilitate compensation for the victims of Semtex bombs who Gaddafi had refused to help. Working with the new government, he's optimistic that in future the supply of deadly weapons from Libya will never again take place. Those in New Libya now, New Libya is inclusive by its nature. And of course it brings in those from the old regime who now support New Libya and its goals, who have had the courage to stand up against Gaddafi and say what went on was wrong. 
what they expressed to us was a deep sorrow for what their leader and those powerful individuals around him had done in supporting the IRA and providing the Semtex, which murdered hundreds. What they showed was a desire to the victims for the first time that ordinary Libyan people, the new Libya, was different. And the new Libya was not going to forget the international victims. But Gaddafi has not forgotten either. While he remains at large, he remains a threat to his own country and to Britain. His desire for revenge has not gone away.